friends, to another edition of TiffinCast. I'm your host, Seishu, and I'm with David H. Wells, who is a photojournalist, a widely published photojournalist, a fantastic teacher, a friend of mine, and uh, we go back, David and I, but I wanted to bring him on to talk about his forthcoming course on Creative Live called Create Powerful Photo Essays and Personal Projects. David, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's very nice to be here. Thank you for having me on. It's nice to connect again. David, I know uh, you've, you've taught uh, many workshops uh, many in, at, in many venues, uh, including uh, Columbia University and uh, you know, lots of different places. What is it that draws you to creative life? I think their format is really, really compelling in the sense that it's going to give students, literally, from what they tell me, all over the world, the opportunity to take in what I'm trying to partake of in small pieces, if they watch it over three days, and come away with a skill set that will, in the best of all worlds, help any photographer, not just a photojournalist. And clearly, your niche is uh, being able to tell stories uh, with, with the camera. You've, you've played around uh, with lots of different cameras. You've, I, I know you've... You've gone mirrorless, if I'm not yes. mistaken, um, and that doesn't really matter. The, the idea is that you're still going to make stories and make a comeback and, and create powerful uh, photo essays. Uh, what is it that you'd suggest uh, of a beginning photographer who's interested in this to say, let's do this? What should that photographer really be prepared to do first? Well, I mean, the, the first thing they should do if they can is dedicate three days to watching it because one of the great things about the Creative Live model, of course, is it's free. Um, but the reason I'm teaching it, to go back to your question and to try mm -hmm. to answer that indirectly, is that any photographer who's trying to distinguish themselves in today's market has a problem, which is in theory, I don't believe it, but in theory, anyone can do this. So how do you distinguish yourself? And one of the easiest ways and the most successful ways is to make a photo essay that, that's unique to your background, your experience, the stories you're trying to tell, your life experience, etc. And so that's what I talk about in the class and that's what I would say to anybody is of course you have to be, have the skills as a photographer but you need to differentiate yourself. And any kind of photo essay gives you the opportunity to say to the end user, this is what I'm about, this is why I'm different than the next guy. When it comes to photo essays, uh, you and I both know that newspapers no longer really run photo essays. Uh, magazines used to run photo essays and those are also uh, really gone. Uh, right. Would you, would you suggest then, uh, if someone who's interested in creating, uh, you know, these photo essays uh, as a as a personal project, even, uh, would you suggest that they self-publish or would they just post it on a website or what is it that? How are they going to be sharing this and this this body of work that they're going to be creating? Well, again, without pushing the class too much, though, I am here to push the class. <laughs> I think it's on the second or possibly third day I talk about alternative markets. Because okay. on the one level, the market that I came out of, Sunday magazines and the physical printed publication, is gone. Having said that, I've really gotten pretty good over the last couple of years. Like my foreclosure project, which is the last thing I did before my current project, was published in literary journals. It was on the ABC News website. Um, it was in some poetry magazines. It got half a dozen exhibits many of which actually paid. So you are correct that the old venues are no longer there. The new venues actually have been enhanced if you understand them. Um, I don't even know if you've seen my latest work. It's on um, houses that are cut in half in India as they make way for new highways in the process of modernization. And the connection being is that I'm, I'm still doing this, but I just found out this morning actually that I'm having an exhibition at the Watson Institute at Brown University. Wow. And, the, and the connection is that they're not interested in photography, they're interested in the impact of globalization. And it's the idea that a lot of times a great project is not about photography, it's about whatever that subject matter is. Right, absolutely. And that's absolutely. a big part of both my process and the class I'm teaching. What is, uh, in, your, in your opinion, uh, the reason why uh, personal projects are so important? Uh, and what are your personal projects at the moment? I think personal projects are important because in this competitive market, you need some way to say to the end user, whoever that end user may be, like my end users are, are, are magazines, of course, but they're also galleries and museums. Frankly, they're workshop students. Those are all audiences who can look at what I do and say, oh, yeah, he actually can do this. He has something that's distinctive to his life experience, et cetera, et cetera. And he can put it in the pictures. He can share it. He can promote it and stuff like that. And I think that 
anybody who's trying to compete in the marketplace needs to do that. And the other thing, which I don't think people understand, is that the other end users, your clients, the people who are going to hire you for jobs, they want to know who you are. They want to know what makes you different. They don't really care that you can push the button. They want to know what are you passionate about, what's your life history, what are the things that you bring that the next guy doesn't. You help them figure out you're the best and you also help them and you also demonstrate you're the best. And a personal project does both of those things. Plus, of course, there's the whole sort of internal emotional reward of doing it yourself. I mean, you can say, not only do I do that for pay, but this is what I care about passionately. This is what makes me unique. It's very emotionally satisfying. And what I'm working on now is the foreclosure project is winding down. And I'm doing some work when I can get back to India, though obviously the logistics are challenging, on what I, what I call half past, which is these houses that are cut in half, literally, to make way for new roads. That sounds fascinating um, and, and troublesome for the folks who live there, obviously. Uh, clearly, uh, they've, they've given up their homes and they have to probably move, right? I'm assuming. Actually, that's the irony is that a lot of these are, if they're illegal houses, they literally cut them in half up to the point that the people are legal. Oh, wow. You know, there's a lot of illegal construction, so you may, yes. own, you, you may own your living room, dining room, and kitchen, but your add-on is now a highway. Wow. Or you'll be compensated by the state if you really own that. So, in fact, rather than demolishing them, quite practically, if you will, they've cut them in half. So there'll be half a house that exists and then a new piece of highway right there. I'll be very sure to, to link back to that, that project uh, under, this, uh, under this video. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you was, uh, when it comes to personal projects, how do you know, well, there's a, clearly a, a start point. When, when's an end point for you? Like, when do you say it's over? Like, let's, <laughs> you know, okay, so one can just keep going on and on, right? Right. I mean, there's a number of variables of when it's over. One is that, is that there's a requirement of faith at the beginning of a project because you have to believe it, and even if other people don't. But then there's also a midpoint in a project where you have to start putting it out there and getting feedback and kind of adjusting what your perception of it is to what the real world kind of recedes. And then in theory, it picks up legs and it starts going. And then in theory, these things happen where it's exhibited, published. And then at some point in time, either you start repeating yourself, which I think is one of your questions, or in the case of the foreclosure crisis, though I personally, and I know this because from all my reading, know there's plenty of foreclosures out there. And there are unfortunately many houses that are in the pipeline. The general belief in this society right now is that it's kind of over. And so what was of a lot of interest to a lot of potential outlets two years ago is getting harder and harder for me to get. So I think the project is ebbing partly based on my outlets are leaving and I feel like I might be beginning to repeat myself. Uh, it's an interesting thing that you bring up outlets. Clearly, uh, you know, as, as a, a working photojournalist who works on these projects, uh, you've got to have it funded in some way so that you get to go home and have a meal or right. pay, pay mortgage and things like that. Uh, how do you go about uh, getting that funding in place? Do you work on the funding first, then the project, or the project sort of takes shape, and then you sort of go, well, let's go find money for it and see what we can do with, uh, you know, with this project? A lot of times it's a chicken and egg thing because there's the question of you can do something that you really believe in, but if it doesn't fit into what I call the larger milieu, and the foreclosure crisis was a great example of something I started because I was interested in, the, in 2009 in the economic decline, and then it kind of morphed into the foreclosure crisis, and then suddenly there was this bigger issue. So my work and the issue matched. And one of the things I tell students all the time is that sometimes you have to take your idea and just tweak it a little bit so your idea and the larger cultural discussion align more. I mean, for example, you know my wife, Anu, her current project is on immigration, which is partly reflecting her own experience, but immigration is such a big issue right now. She's been very successful in dovetailing what she wants to do and what the, the market out there does. The second part of that becomes, okay, so now you've kind of adjusted it to, to fit in, then you start putting it out there. It's just the ch other part of the chicken and egg is you know the first exhibition, the first publication, the first online dissemination. All of those things give you credibility, so then when you go to to the next people, they say, oh, yeah, he got it exhibited. The Watson Institute at Brown University exhibited that. And it's exactly, I suddenly have credibility with right. this work because of that. So they all become kind of symbiotic. And again, to go back to the, the class that we're discussing, a part of this is talking about the when do you believe yourself and when do you say, no, actually, I have to kind of let go of some of this and see what the market 
and I do mean in a larger sense. Like the Watson is technical, it's an academic institution, but I think of it as kind of the market as they've given me feedback and saying, yeah, we get this work. Um, the, the, I think that's the larger question for me is, uh, you know, you, you've got your start, you've got your funding, you've got the potential to have it published. Um, do you ever wonder, so what? Like, so what? As in, does it make a difference? I mean, do you feel like you, you're, you're doing these to make a difference? Or is it sort of like, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's a sort of a, a way for you to just continue producing work that will, will lead to something else? No, I, like to, I mean, I like to think it all makes a difference. Um, the foreclosure project in particular, because I've had a lot of good luck exhibiting it, and a lot of different outlets, I do think it's become part of dialogues that people have been having in different neighborhoods in different cities. I was very fortunate. Art Space in North Carolina, for example, not only did they exhibit it, but they connected me to somebody who could get me to some houses into North Carolina. So it really became part of this thing that Art Space had around an event, the work, the dialogue, the people, some of whom were from the area, came, and I, I think it created a conversation. And so far, I've been fortunate that I, almost all the projects somehow create a conversation. I think any personal project does because you're, it's like a great movie, a great book, a great poem. You're putting yourself into it. You're offering it up for other people. And people look at that and say, wow, I never thought of it that way. I never looked at it that way. So, mm -hmm. so far, I've never, I haven't personally run into that. Part of it's also there's a lot of things that I don't do as personal projects because I'm not motivated. Indeed. Okay. I, think, I think if I had to do a, I mean, somebody says you have to do a personal project on fashion, which is something I don't. <laughs> it could be a problem. So far, I've been very lucky. Indeed. Um, speaking of lucky, and, and, and I'm sure it has little to do with my next question, but the fact is you have uh, been awarded a couple of Fulbright scholarships to India. Two Fulbright fellowships. Your tax dollars down the can. Yes, please. <laughs> why, why, why would you say that? Why I'm would you be sarcastic. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it was, it, they were wonderful experiences. I really feel like I learned a lot about the impact of globalization firsthand. Um, again, I'm being sarcastic. No, they, they were wonderful experiences. The first one I was teaching photojournalism to Indian graduate students um, who at the time were very heavily under-resourced, didn't have film, had one camera between them, so we really had to wow. improvise. And then the second one I was comparing the impact of globalization um, in Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and India by comparison. And you know, I, I learned a lot. I did, one of the things to go back to one of your earlier questions is that one of the reasons that I've been successful to date is that I've developed something of an expertise in South Asia. Again, a lot of times it's subject matter. It's not about photography. If somebody wants somebody who knows something about South Asia and can visualize it, I'm one of the people on the list. Indeed, indeed. I think that's that's one of the things I wanted to draw out of you is like, uh, you know, certainly you've, you've got your your skill set as a photojournalist, but you know, you're not just a guy who presses a button, but you're you're out there you know, really analyzing and researching a story and then diving in and, and being able to make images that are somewhat uh, meaningful or definitely meaningful for the larger uh, larger group of people who are viewing the, the images, I'm, I'm right? Saying, right? Um, uh, my last question to you is, uh, you know, it's three days at Creative Life, uh, clearly not your first time teaching, uh, uh, is there, is there anything in particular that you feel uh, students should, should be aware of uh, before they, they jump into this class? Something that will help them do, do, do something that will help them excel uh, in, in completing the class with you? Well, I, I think, yes. One of the things that they've asked me to do at Creative Live is to end every session with a uh, call to action, which sounds silly, but it's actually a very nice way of saying, okay. We just finished that. The lesson I want you to take away is this. Now go home and just do A, B, C, and D. Okay? And then, I, then there's a break, and then I do the next session, and I give these call to actions. And the art is to, of course, sit through the whole thing, but to write down those call to actions, because by the third, second or third day, you may feel like, oh, you're up to here, but write them all down and do them going forward and come back to them in six months or a year. Because there's a couple of them where I say, okay, do this now, and then come back and do the same thing in a month. Um, and if you do all of those, not only will you internalize what I've been showing you and saying about the pictures, but you'll start examining your own process. And that's, that's the end goal to take away from it. It's nice that I say all this stuff, but what the, the viewers should do is say, okay, so 
I understand what he's doing, but how does that apply to me? What can mm, I take away? Right, 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 right. And the, the call to action at the end of them are designed specifically to get the students to say, okay, for my workflow, for my creative situation, for my market, for my audience, these are the things I should be thinking about. David, uh, you know, I've always enjoyed uh, our conversations, uh, but I've, I've always known you as a, as a fantastic teacher, and I'm, I'm so excited that you're on this, on this uh, new Creative Live uh, course uh, called Create, Create Powerful Photo Essays and Personal Projects. Um, I think if those of you who probably will sit down and go through this for the three days, whether you do it for free or pay for it later, it doesn't matter, uh, you're going to get tons and tons of great information from David. Um, David, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. I'm assuming you're going to mention the dates in there when you do this. Indeed. It's June 30th <laughs> through July 2nd, and it's from 12 p.m. to 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, Eastern, Eastern, East, Eastern. Is that Eastern Time? Yeah, that's Eastern Time, 9 okay. to 4 Pacific Time. Okay, yes, 9 to 4 Pacific Time. <laughs> Let's not get those times wrong. Uh, let me say that again. June 30th through July 2nd, uh, 12 p.m. to 7 p.m., uh, New York Standard Time, uh, Eastern Standard Time. It's, it's going to be a fantastic, uh, fantastic course, and I look forward to it. Thank you so much for having me. I look forward to uh, seeing this, and I'm looking forward to interacting with the students online during the class. Wonderful. Take care, David. Take care. Talk to Bye. you soon. Bye-bye.